So, dobré ráno, dámy a pánové. Čas je nyní 9.06, tak já bych navrhoval, abychom začali. A já přejdu do angličtiny, protože většina, no vlastně všichni panelisté budou dnes mluvit anglicky, takže ten panel povedeme angličtině. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, first panel of our uh, today's program. I am very pleased and honored uh, to have this opportunity to chair this, uh, this panel, uh, which um, uh, centers perhaps not so much on the international Uh, but rather on the global context of the collapse of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, as well as um, the ways how uh, these seminal events um, of 1989 are treated by the political science theory as well as uh, terminology. Uh, I will always introduce, uh, introduce each of the panelists. Uh, each of them will then have 20 minutes uh, to speak, and uh, then we will, we will proceed with uh, discussion. So our uh, first uh, panelist is uh, David Priestland. Uh, he's a professor of modern history at the University of Oxford. Uh, he has published uh, extensively on the topic of communism in the world and the Soviet Union. And uh, now he focuses uh, on the development of market liberalism since the 1970s. Out of his books, uh, I would mention at least uh, the, the red flag a History of Communism, published in 2009, uh, Stalinism and the Politics of Mobilization, uh, 2007, and Merchant, Soldier, Sage, A New History of Power, uh, 2012. And the topic of his today's presentation is A Global Revolution, 1989 in Europe and beyond. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, and um, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Is it on? No, it won't. Sorry, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and thanks very much for the invitation, and it's a, it, it's a great honor to be speaking in Prague on this anniversary. Now, in April 1989, Thabo Mbeki, the exiled leading spokesman of the African uh, Na National Congress and a major figure in the South African Communist Party, chaired the seventh Congress of the party, which announced the strategy of people's war, the violent seizure of power from the apartheid regime. But at the same time, he was negotiating with the nationalist government, the apartheid government, without telling his more radical Communist Party colleagues, He was doing it secretly, and by September 1989, he was negotiating for the pluralist transition, democratic transition that took place from 1990. He was partly reacting to change in the USSR. In the same month that Mbeki was in Cuba, Gorbachev, having initially supported uh, uh, increased support for militant groups like the ANC, responded to the success of opposition forces in the 1989 elections in the Soviet Union to the Congress of People's Deputies by declaring, we are resolutely against any form of export of revolution or of counter-revolution. But 1989 was only a staging post in a longer shift in Mbeki's position from the Moscow Lenin School trainee of 1969, 20 years before, great enthusiast for Soviet-style communism, to a head of an ANC government who abandoned many of the early redistributive promises in the name of fiscal discipline in the mid-1990s under pressure from the markets and the IMF, to, in the 2000s, a positive advocate of a neoliberal third-wave politics, 
um, in the mid-2000s when he introduced a controversial flexible wage policy. Now, and Beckett's story could be and has been interpreted in different ways. One is that the period of the late 80s was crucial because the ANC was deprived of Soviet military support. Hence, 1989's significance was largely geopolitical. Another view was that Mbeki was always on the less militant wing of the Communist Party. He was changing position throughout the 1980s. It's no surprise that he ended up as a third-way neoliberal, given the intellectual and political changes over the period. This then would see 1989 as part of a broader political ideological shift away towards liberalism across the world throughout the 80s, 70s and 80s and 90s. And a third view was that he was influenced not by the events of the 80s themselves, but by the way that powerful global elites, the IMF and, uh, uh, and others, interpreted 1989, combined with the uh, unleashing of powerful global financial markets. So it was that that it, it made the chain, made the difference. And these three versions of Mbeki's career can be seen in the very different approaches taken by the literature on 1989 as a global event. That is, was its significance as a geopolitical shift? Was it an important staging post in a broader ideological change amongst elites and ultimately amongst populations, moving towards a greater liberalism uh, from more radical forms of politics? Or was it a revolution whose meaning was sort of hijacked by neoliberal ideologues, local elites, American power, and global economic institutions? There's another view, which I suppose uh, would be supported by an analysis of the non-communist, non-violent township movements that was ha happening in South Africa itself at the time and had nothing to do with uh, the Mbeki, which might go along with a sort of Huntington third wave of democratization analysis that 1989 was more of a socio-political change uh, towards or transition to pluralistic democracy. But more generally, that literature doesn't really agree on whether 1989 was a global revolution in the sense of that the long 1968 was or 1917 to 21 was. Um, and, and is this a revolution or is it something else? Admittedly, this literature is still pretty small, uh, at least the Western literature is, although uh, that has changed with the very impressive uh, and path-breaking new book by uh, James Mark and his collaborators, which he was talking about yesterday. So in this paper, I'll go through these four different approaches. First, geopolitical. The second two, the, the next two rather more broadly ideological approaches, one liberal in orientation, one anti-liberal in orientation, and the fourth, I suppose, the more Huntingtonian socio-political. All of them, I think, have something to them, uh, though there's probably more work to be done on the last one, I would suggest, the, the socio-political, as I'll explain. Okay, so as to the first, that 1989 was a revolution that primarily took place in Eastern Europe, possibly, I suppose, in China as well, a failed revolution in China. But globally, its significance was not that it was a global revolution, but it, it, it contributed to a shift in global geopolitical power. Now, this was, um, I think, the, this became the common view in Western academia, I think, of, uh, on the global 1989. At the time, in, 19, in the 1990s, there wasn't actually that much awareness in public discussion of the massive impact of 1989 uh, on the global south in the public debate. Um, I mean, the Soviet collapse, it's been estimated, directly affected a quarter, about a quarter of states in the world. But also, it, uh, I, I, supported by pro-left um, Soviet uh, allied regimes, but it also affected another 12 or so right-wing authoritarian regimes, uh, right-wing regimes who justified their existence as a counter to the communist threat. It also undermined various national liberation struggles, the ANC, of course, the PLO, but even the IRA, it's been argued, ha um, had a, it had a major impact on the IRA um, because it justified its uh, militant position in Cold War terms. And so we saw the, 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 the rise of a various, the development of various negotiated pieces across the world. 
Um, the ana this analysis, though, of a geopolitical uh, impact became more common in academia among international relations specialists and international relations students. And really, most of the global 1989 literature I've come across really looked, took this position. It saw it actually not so much of, as a revolution than as a post-war phenomenon, an end of Cold War phenomenon. So one of the first collections that treated this seriously that I came across was a, a, a collection called Three Post-War Eras in Comparison, 1918, 1945, and 1989, featuring an essay by Charles Mayer. And 10 years ago, for the last anniversary, a collection entitled The Global 1989 was published, but really this was all by international relations people and historians of international relations, people like Fred Halliday, for instance, sort of leftist analyst of Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern politics. Um, and they, they nearly all saw this through the prism of the end of the Cold War. In recent years, since the financial crisis, attention has moved among many historians, not just Marxists, as was the case before, towards looking at 89 in terms of international economic power, not just political and military power. So recent work has explored the ways in which the United States had actively encouraged the rise of private global finance since the 70s, a central part of its global power projection, and, and this became particularly important after the 80s debt crisis. And once communism was off the scene, of course, in the 1990s, it was clear that the neoliberal financialized form of development promoted by the IMF, by the US, by the EU, was the only game in town. And that really has been the case until the rise of the Chinese uh, glo uh, global Belt and Road Initiative in recent years, which has provided an alternative source of development income and development strategies. Now, these geopolitical analyses were clearly attractive to the more leftish uh, group, uh, leftish writers, as, as in a way it saw what to them were the unwelcome changes of 89 and the, the rise of neoliberalism and all of those things, or the, the spread of real, neoliberalism, it, saw a, it as the result of a contingent military defeat rather than some fundamental or deep-rooted ideological defeat. And the notion that 89 signaled a more fundamental defeat of non-liberal politics was, in a way, the more dominant interpretation in public sphere, um, and it was the view preferred by liberals, both on the centre-right and centre-left, and... Uh, um, in the sense that the revolutions of 89 mark the culmination of this fundamental change at a global level. Um, and this position was, of course, most famously captured by Fukuyama's End of History. Um, probably will be mentioned rather a lot this, in this, this, this event, but I think it's an important text because it really did help to popularize this argument. I mean, it was a deservedly influential book because it popularized this argument that um, 89 represented, as, as Michal said, a change in the Hegelian zeitgeist. And uh, it also helped popularize the argument that the specific content of that shift was a victory of both economic liberalism I, capitalist markets and political liberalism. Now, Fukuyama was not a neoliberal in that he thought that social democratic politics was sort of okay in this model, but um, clearly this, um, this view, uh, th th his view could, could actually spread to, could actually be adopted by people on the left as well as the right, the center left. So we see it in a lot of sort of new left writings, thinking about sort of Manuel Castells, uh, the, the, the network age, you know, they sort of hit, sort of sociologist, but new left sociologist of, of uh, historian, come historian of, of this era uh, as a new knowledge economy that really was very much, assumed quite a lot of this sort of liberal approach. And, in, and really, I would say it, it in, informed a lot of the popular histories and quite some, a lot of the academic histories of this era. Yet in the last 10 years, as 890s neo liberal, proje liberal projects have come under question. Another ideological interpretation of the global 89 has emerged that's more critical of liberalism. 
one from the anti-cosmopolitan right, but particularly from the left. And this is the view that 89 had a global impact because of the way the West used its ideological and cultural power, not just its military and political power, to capture the narrative of 89 and propagate a particular liberal interpretation of 89 across the world. The revolutions themselves prop, uh, comprise many different political impulses, as indeed do most social revolutions. So as James Crapfel has argued, they included socialist elements as well as pro-market ones. And as Mikhail Kopacek has shown um, in his intellectual history of Eastern Europe, there was a struggle between liberals, nationalists, and others over the meaning of 89 within Eastern Europe itself. Um, however, a particular view of the revolutions as the, showing the triumph of neoliberalism and human rights, liberal cosmopolitanism against statism, uh, it is argued, was propagated by the now globally hegemonic Western governments, together with think tanks, international press, so-called thought leaders, they're not, as they're now called. And this view, I think, came through very much in James Mark's excellent book. He talks of the establishment, as he said yesterday, of 89 as a powerful global script, justifying the inevitable victory of uh, liberalism and delegitimizing the radical left. They also acknowledge that these were rooted in a longer term disillusionment with radical leftist solutions throughout the world, including the global south. I also think we see this sort of view of uh, the historiography emerging in the recent historiography of human rights. Sam Moyne in his last Utopia, 2012, Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, 2018, argues that human rights projects should not be seen as simply a project of sort of Hegelian or Fukuyaman progress, but a specifically liberal project to mar marginalize not only Marxism, but the economically egalitarian left more generally, specifically the left championed by socialist nationalists of the global south. He places the, the rise of this um, human rights uh, discourse in the long 70s, um, with the crisis of Marxism, but uh, Stefan Ludwig Hoffmann has places it in the immediate post-89 period with the Yugoslav wars and particularly the crisis over the human rights behavior, the, the human rights breaches of the Serbs. And this was definitely, we saw a Cold War discourse of anti-totalitarianism being mobilized here. And we also see specifically very deliberate attempts, the clearest example of using 89 to promote a specifically neoliberal politics are even more evident in the neoliberal context. James Mark's book has some very interesting details about how East Central Europeans engaged in proselytizing neoliberal ideas across the world. And a very good example, I don't have time to go into it here, but if you watch that uh, free to choose video of 1990 by Milton Friedman, you can see a very interesting episode where he is discussing with Václav Klaus and others the, the possibility of a third way uh, non-communist path uh, between markets and, and, uh, and socialism and, and dismissing it and saying really the, the real 1989, the real communism is free markets, you can't have not some other form of mixed economy. So I think it seems to me that all three interpretations, the geopolitical, the left ideological, if you like, and the uh, liberal ideological explain aspects of global 1989. Of course, the de historically determinist ideas of Fukuyama are, are unconvincing, but I think we do need a combination of those liberal approaches which trace a fundamental shift in views away from politics, from collectivism towards liberalism, and were many particularly global elites from the 70s, as well as the non-liberal approaches which show how these discourses were instrumentalized by, for political purposes, especially in 1989. So I think all of these three have something to tell us about 89. But I think there's a fourth way of identifying a global 1989 as a more socio-political phenomenon, which has something in common with um, Huntington's um, third wave of democratization analysis. Although looking back at that article, it's extraordinary how sort of westocentric and American nationalist it is, which I don't think I'd quite appreciated when I read it originally. So I think what I'd like to say is that we can see, we, there is a way of looking at these 
1989 as part of a whole range of genuine social revolutions in a long 1980s. People's power in the Philippines, non-violent township movements in South Africa, movements against military dictatorships in Latin America, to the Indonesian events of 1997-98, the toppling of the dictatorship there. Now, comparing all of these may seem implausible. They're more disparate than, say, the 1968 revolutions, but they are all cross-class, non-violent movements which have abandoned the use of vanguardist parties, people's war, and rely on decentralized organizations, peaceful protest and boycotts um, to challenge regimes that are seen as unjust or corrupt. Admittedly, some of these uh, strategies were adopted for pragmatic, not ideological reasons. It was very, states were often very strong in these, uh, in, in, in these regions. South Africa is a very good example. Uh, whereas clearly in, in the Czech Republic it is, and, and Eastern Europe, there is much more of an ideological element behind the nonviolence. Uh, but I think uh, we can see some commonality in all of these movements, but obviously this would need further investigation. Now, looking back from today, it may seem that all of these movements were extraordinarily diverse in their goals and, their, and in a way more generally their commitments to liberalism, pluralism in the name of some um, post-ideological moment which Pavel Varsha was discussing yesterday. In, in some ways all of these uh, approaches seem uh, all of the, this approach to revolution, of course, is very different to the approaches to revolution 1968. And we could, we, we could argue that they fail to see the power structures that were waiting to take advantage of this new order after these, re, after these social movements and revolutions, the post-dictatorial, the post-authoritarian moment. And we see this very clearly I think um, in an editorial of the 1st of January 1992 in Jansata, which is a Hindi language uh, newspaper in India, a Gandhian newspaper that is non-neoliberal, moralistic leftish, but anti-communist. This newspaper is very critical of what they saw as the leftist pro-Soviet authoritarianism of the Congress governments of the 1970s, the Indira Gandhi emergency. So this is a sort of new leftish, well, Gandhian left, anti-authoritarian left uh, position. And he wrote the period, the, sorry, the, the, the editorial wrote, the period between the 1917 Soviet revolution and 1991 was the age of ideologies. But now is the time of post-ideology. The lesson of 91 is that man can only be happy of his own accord. The global acceptance of liberal democracy and free market is a victory of individual agency, by that meaning purushat, which is a, a sort of Hindi word meaning self-realization or something, I suppose. Or, no, it isn't self-realization, it's self-appointed self goals, self-chosen goals, or agency. Now, neither will a political party be able to sell the dream of making humanity realize the ultimate truth in the guise of working people's rights or communism, nor will any third, any third world dictator be able to establish an authoritarian regime. In 1991, the Soviet Union's authoritarian regime disintegrated, and so did the two and a half decade long regime of Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia. In the new global order, one may be afraid of prospective American dominance. This fear is baseless. In the age of post-ideology, a, a unipolar world order is impossible. Now, this of course seems extraordinarily myopic <laughs> and naive. This uh, editorial did not see that the ideals of economic liberalism, pluralistic democracy and human rights could be mobilized or, and would be mobilized to support a new set of global power structures uh, that arguably would be even more resilient and powerful than the authoritarian regimes of old. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your <coughs> presentation, which uh, I'm sure will, uh, will provoke an interesting discussion. Our second speaker will be uh, Lyubica Spaskovska, uh, who teaches at the University of Exeter. Her research centers on the political and socio-cultural history of internationalism, especially the development of de decolonization and relations between Europe and the global south.
Uh, she further uh, focuses on the topic of, uh, of student internationalism in the interwar period and the Spanish Civil War, the movement of the non-aligned uh, nations and the end of the European colonial empires. Uh, she also examines socio-cultural history of international relations between Southeast Europe and Asia and Africa, the collapse of state socialism and history of Yugoslavia, all, of course, in global perspective. Uh, she has published uh, the book, uh, The Last Yugoslav Generation, and the rethinking of youth uh, politics and cultures in late socialism, published two years ago. And the uh, title of her today's presentation is 1989, Symbol of Peace or Violence? Question mark. Thank you very much. Uh, I was fortunate as well uh, and privileged to be part also of this collective uh, effort uh, on the uh, volume on the global history of Eastern Europe with Professor James Mark. Uh, so uh, my uh, really contribution to it was in the realm of uh, yeah, peace, violence, and uh, inscribing Eastern Europe into global histories of self-determination. So partially my presentation today will draw upon some of the conclusions uh, from the book. Uh, so, just to make sure this works, yes. Uh, so, as I said, uh, we uh, endeavored also to uh, situate uh, the, the region within a global history of self-determination, a powerful concept which, as we know, stems from uh, the Leninist and Wilsonian notions uh, of self-governance or government by consent uh, at the beginning of, uh, the, uh, after the First World War however, had a major impact also uh, on the events uh, around 1989, especially in Southeastern Europe and the Balkans. Uh, so I would like to start by this quote from uh, Adam Michnik. Uh, so he wrote this in 1982 while being in the internment camp in Bialoleka in Poland. So he talked about the goal of self-determination. So he said, reflection on analogous endeavors from some 80 years ago can create an intellectual bridge between the era of our ancestors and now, when it is our turn to strive for independence. So various interpretations and meanings of self-determination came into play and informed a lot of this uh, independence struggles or struggles for uh, democracy and sovereignty. So, uh, we argued uh, that a reassertion of national self-determination drove both anti-Soviet and pro-democracy movements in Eastern Europe, but it also led to the dissolution of the three large multinational socialist federations, namely uh, Socialist Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and the Soviet Union, uh, with uh, the former Yugoslavia, of course, being the, the most prominent example of, uh, uh, of a violent uh, dissolution and transformation to democracy. Uh, so, violence uh, became a means to achieving self-determination, especially, as I would argue, in Yugoslavia and in parts of the Global South. So, more radical notions of self-determination unleashed tensions that a fragmenting authoritarian order could no longer uh, suppress. And in the Balkan context in particular, and especially in other countries like, I will mention later, Rwanda, Algeria, India, ethnically or religiously, uh, defined nationalisms filled the ideological void left by the fall of socialism or left by the fall of different semi-authoritarian or authoritarian regimes stemming from the Cold War. So the ensuing violence in Yugoslavia and parts of the uh, southern Soviet periphery meant that the end of socialism was not so much a democratic awakening as an era of disintegration, chaos, uh, and decline. Uh, so, before all of these events, uh, as we know, uh, took a radical turn, uh, especially in Yugoslavia, uh, the drive to self-determination, especially to, uh, as uh, President Bush here says in this excerpt, uh, to, towards a local despotism, was still uh, kind of seen with caution. So, in a speech uh, in 1991, uh, he said that freedom should not be, is not the same as independence. Americans will not support those who seek in order to replace a far off tyranny with a local despotism. They will not aid those who promote a suicidal nationalism based upon ethnic ha hatred. 
And this type of thinking also informed the U.S. policy towards the former Yugoslavia, where they were very much in support of a federal solution of some sort of a unitary uh, federation uh, and democratic transition, but they supported basically the survival of the federal government until uh, very late. And even interestingly enough, the U.S. ambassador in Belgrade provided uh, special force protection for the last federal prime minister of Yugoslavia. Um, uh, Ante Markovic. So contrary to a lot of popular opinion, especially in the Balkans, that the U.S. was profoundly responsible for the breakup, on the contrary, we found that uh, actually uh, it was quite uh, the opposite. Uh, so 1989, actually, in the former Yugoslavia was, as many would claim, a non-event. In 1989, uh, Yugoslavia hosted the last Cold War non-aligned summit uh, in Belgrade. Uh, and as uh, uh, an, an article in the Sarajevo Citizen later declared, and this was quoted in this academic article, he said that the Berlin Wall actually crumbled down upon our heads. So uh, uh, despite, uh, yes, uh, the, the significance of 89 for uh, the whole of Eastern Europe and especially uh, also Bulgaria and Romania in that sense in, in the Balkan space, uh, in Yugoslavia uh, events took uh, quite a different turn, although as I would, ar as I would show uh, it had a lot of similarities as well. Uh, so uh, for the rest of the globe, uh, what, was what happened actually in Yugoslavia more relevant than what took place in Poland? And could Yugoslavia, we asked, not Poland, be the case that most resembled the ethnically and religiously divided parts of the world? So uh, we argued that certainly uh, one could take this view. So explaining violence by comparing formerly non-aligned Yugoslavia, not with the former Eastern Bloc, but rather with the many outbreaks of communal, inter-ethnic and religious violence in the non-aligned world and in the global south, uh, is actually what marked the immediate post-1989 era. So in many uh, ways, we can draw comparisons here between Southeastern Europe and the Global South, and in that way, uh, also approach a global history uh, of 1989. Uh, so the explosion of ethnic and religious nationalism as a replacement for a socialist ideology that no longer provided political legitimacy and violent intercommunal strife based on it at the heart, were at the heart of many similar conflicts around the world. So as I mentioned, not only Yugoslavia, but India, Algeria, and Rwanda. Uh, I will mention uh, Algeria, uh, India in more detail, but in Algeria, for instance, you know that in 1988, uh, there were riots that broke out, uh, basically delegitimizing the post-revolutionary status quo. And in 1991, after an Islamic electoral victory, uh, which led to a coup, a 10-year civil war ensued. So in many cases, the, the violence against civilians in Algeria Algeria was comparable to that in the Balkans. In Rwanda, as you know, uh, there is a huge both historiography and literature in human rights and international law that compares actually Bosnia and Rwanda and the two genocides. And both were driven, uh, in our view, by idealized notions of territorial uh, and religious or ethnic purity, uh, both in Bosnia and in Rwanda. Uh, so Misha Glenny was a reporter uh, during the Bosnian War, uh, and uh, I was really struck by, uh, when I read uh, this uh, excerpt of uh, his observations uh, while he was reporting from the Balkans. He said, it was clear that many, more than any other colleagues uh, while in Bosnia, it was the correspondence of the Indian media, all highly educated and secular, who most fervently supported the integrity of the Yugoslav Federation in the face of competing nationalist movements. It is not hard to understand why. On one level, they were writing as much about India as they were about Yugoslavia. So perhaps you're aware that at the same time, also India was facing this crumbling of the Nehruvian secularist national, national model, and the, there was this famous uh, incident in the, at the Ayotthya uh, mosque. Uh, so sectarian violence was also kind of exploding in India. So in many uh, ways, what he's referring to is this uh, almost uh, <coughs> Uh, identification of secular Indians with kind of secular uh, uh, Yugoslavs at the time. So 
as another <laughs> article, <laughs> this one by Nick Miller asked, and it was, it's a very poignant question, I think, and worth pondering, although no one has really managed to, answer, to give one specific answer, where was the Serbian Havel? Uh, and why, despite a wide uh, mobilization, this is a picture, a photograph from 1992 from the protests in Bosnia, in Sarajevo. These were protests for peace and uh, uh, cohabitation, and as you can see, actually many people were carrying still the picture of Tito, and public opinion was still in favor of some sort of uh, Yugoslav Union uh, and Federation and was, especially in Bosnia, people were not in support of war and uh, dis disintegration. Why in spite of all of this and the efforts of the US and the EU to preserve the Union, there was uh, actually violence and one of the worst violences on European soil in the 20th century erupted. Uh, so unlike uh, in this case, the Czech context where uh, President Havel framed a lot of this uh, right struggles and aspiration for a post-authoritarian order in terms of human rights, individual rights, Serbian leaders uh, actually framed them in collective terms. And self-determination was seen as, a, as in, in terms of ethnic and national self-determination. So for instance, Serbian leaders claimed that uh, sir, uh, the one and a half million Serbs who lived in Bosnia or the 600,000 who live in Croatia have a right, like the Germans who got reunited, so uh, quoting from the German Unification Treaty, like the German Serbs also have a right to live in one state. And basically this led uh, to, the, uh, to, to the conflict in Bosnia initially and then in Croatia as well. Uh, so this is a map which shows that uh, complex multi-ethnicity in Yugoslavia, and we argued that it was precisely this very complex combination of complex multi-ethnicity uh, uh, and very intertwined uh, kind of religious cultural uh, uh, communities uh, coupled with the complex federal system that existed in Yugoslavia where states had the, where republics had the prerogatives of states uh, that also uh, contributed to this outcome. So. National federalism, as I mentioned, was implemented in all of the three uh, socialist federations, but in Yugoslavia it had a very specific form and complexity because it was eight federal units basically who had a very high degree of autonomy. Uh, and uh, nationalist forces incubated in late socialism in Yugoslavia were radicalized from the late 1980s, especially at the level of the republics. And all efforts, as I argued, to enact reform at federal level, call a federal referendum, uh, or hold federal elections were undermined by the republic's leaderships. So the only elections that took place in 1990 and 91 were at the level of republics and never a federal election took place. So republics had their own parliaments, they had their own parties, they had um, uh, commissions for foreign relations, etc. So basically they were very well equipped at the end of the 1980s to just make this final step and claim to self national self-determination. And finally, there was a particular understanding of the right to self national or ethnic self-determination, although it was informed by the Leninist, of course, notion there was a right to secession embedded in the Yugoslav constitution. Uh, however, uh, the Yugoslav elite pioneered this notion of the Marxist notion of the withering away of the state from the 1970s, and the federal center was deliberately weakened from 1974 onwards uh, when a new federal constitution uh, was approved. So, as I said, this led to the worst violence in Europe and Bosnia, uh, although it compares in many ways to Rwanda. One thing that kind of also uh, makes it uh, very particular and has resonances and echoes to this day, I think, was the involvement of foreign war volunteers and m both volunteers and mercenaries uh, in the war in Bosnia on all sides. So there was, uh, we argued that this conflict was defined religion-based ethnic identities along the lines of global civilizational front lines. And a lot of global religious uh, and ideological struggles were brought at the heart of the Yugoslav conflict through the involvement of these foreign fighters. So for example, in uh, the Bosnian army there was a separate uh, unit called the El Mujahid, which drew volunteers also who took part in the uh, Afghan war in the 1980s, also volunteers from other Arabic uh, states. 
Uh, so on the side of the Bosnian Muslims, there were Ukrainians, Russians, Greeks, uh, and Romanians who fought on the Serbian side in Bosnia, and of course, a lot of the Croat emigres uh, and other French, British, American, Dutch, German mercenaries who fought both in Bosnia and in Croatia on the Croatian side. Uh, so this, as I said, uh, made the Bosnian conflict quite specific, especially that some of the uh, Islamic fighters in this case went on to uh, participate in other terrorist attacks later in Western Europe. So there is a trajectory, a very interesting trajectory for some of them to be traced from, uh, let's say, Afghanistan in the 1980s all the way to more or less the present, present day. Uh, and this led to a particular framing of Southeastern Europe, and uh, very poignantly, uh, in this case, by Robert Kaplan, who called uh, the region a third, a third world region within Europe. So also this, uh, in an interesting way, I think, uh, puts the region uh, uh, in a very, uh, embeds it in uh, the global south, also in symbolic terms. And also I came across uh, similar framings, uh, kind of orientalizing, almost orientalizing views uh, at the UN archive. So even UN officials at the time, uh, like in this case in 1989, for example, they wrote in this memo, the battle lines are reminiscent of the old discords between the Catholics of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Orthodox and Muslim peoples of the Ottoman Empire and between areas belonging to the Latin and Byzantine traditions respectively. So the whole region uh, uh, came to be framed in this very uh, yeah, uh, divided civilizational almost uh, uh, terms. So. Uh, a lim it became a liminal space in a way in media representations in uh, also in a scholarly discourse at the time if Kaplan's book was quite influential. Uh, so a liminal space between Europe and a, and a global style that stood beyond the realm of safe, peaceful continental politics which was developed since 1945. So the solution that was sought uh, finally was um, uh, drove basically uh, the EU, in the first instance, the European Economic Community at the time, to establish a peace conference for Yugoslavia, but also to establish uh, the so-called Badinter Commission. Uh, so this is the picture in the background of Robert Badinter, who presided over the commission, uh, to come up with a legal framing of the crisis and of the outcomes. So very interestingly, in this case, we argue in the book that self-determination in a way traveled from the global south to the global north to Europe, and I'll explain how. So we, Western governments did indeed lack the legal and political vocabulary to make sense of and deal with the complexity of the Balkan crisis. And in that case, uh, what these legal experts came up with was that made Yugoslavia become the first country outside of the global south where the legal principles of uti possidetis was applied. And this legal principle uh, meant that uh, basically upgraded former administrative uh, delimitations uh, established during the colonial period to international frontiers. And they literally drew, uh, on, on this case, from, uh, uh, on the language and the principle was drawn from the case concerning the frontier dispute between Burkina Faso and Mali from 1986 from the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. So it was very striking when we found this that, and how basically as this principle of self-determination and uh, delimitation of uh, former administrative borders into international borders which happened in Yugoslavia uh, was transposed from a global south conflict uh, context to, uh, to Europe. And just to conclude, um, whereas westernized elites uh, as elsewhere in the ethnically more homogeneous and politically centralized Central European countries effectively disciplined their transition and kept out radical nationalists, such an option was less viable in multi-ethnic Yugoslavia with its complex confederal-like structure. A complex and often fragile ethnic balance under an authoritarian system could quickly unravel with tragic consequences at the first attempt of changing the status quo and introducing a Western-type multi-party democracy. Both Bosnia and Rwanda became examples of how idealized territorial aspirations of an ethnically pure nation state could set the stage for genocide. And finally, the inter-ethnic violence that came to be associated with 1989 and the end of the Cold War in Yugoslavia, India, Rwanda, Iraq, left powerful legacies whose negative consequences are felt in those regions to this day, clearly exposing the dual often contradictory meaning of 89 as a world event. Thank you.
So thank you very much for another very interesting presentation and for bringing this Yugoslav experience as well as the others. And um, our third speaker will be uh, Pavel Ukielski, uh, who is the deputy director of the Warsaw Rising Museum. He also works uh, at the Institute of Political Science of the Polish Academy of Sciences and teaches at the University uh, Collegium Civitas. His research and lectures focus on transformation and regional uh, cooperation in Central and Eastern Europe, the breakup of Czechoslovakia, and Czech-Slovak relations. He is the author of the book about the Velvet Divorce, uh, the breakup of Czechoslovakia uh, in Czech, Summit of Jerozvod, uh, and co-author of a book, uh, 1989, The Autumn of Nations, which has been published uh, in Polish, Romanian, uh, Hungarian, and will soon be published in Czech and Slovak. And uh, the topic of his today's uh, presentation is 1989 uh, with uh, the slightly provocative um, subtitle, A Counter-Revolution in, in Central Europe. Thank you very much. Uh, I was to say that it is uh, quite a provocative to say about a counter-revolution on the conference entitled Revolution of 1989, but I hope I will uh, convince you to the possibility of such an approach to the, to the Central European changes in 1989. Almost 30 years ago, the communist regimes of Central and Eastern Europe collapsed. During the so-called Autumn of Nations in 1989, the nations of the region liberated themselves from, from Soviet-imposed oppression. After regaining independence and replacing the former communist ruling elites with the new leadership, they began to rapidly change their social, economic, and political systems, as well as their legal and institutional frameworks. The lit literature on this subject contains numerous interpretations of these changes in Central and Eastern Europe, while debates about how best to characterize the fall of the communist regimes have raged for many years. Researchers continue to ponder and argue over how revolutionary as opposed to evolutionary or reformatory these changes were. I would like to propose a new approach. My thesis is that the term counter-revolution most accurately describes what happened in Central and Eastern Europe in 1989. Although this term was often misused by the communists in, the, in their propaganda, I propose to remove it from the, its ideological context and instead use it as a means to describe a historical process. Let's start with definitions. There is, of course, no time to discuss the theory of revolution or different definitions that appeared for many years in the uh, literature. Therefore, I just tell what I will understand as a revolution. Revolution is a rapid, fundamental, and violent domestic change in political institutions, leadership, and government activity, and policies accompanied by deep change in the social structure and system of values. Such changes are subordinated to a holistic ideology, which aims to reorganize a society in a complex way. I will stress this meaning of the holistic ideology there. Whilst the term revolution has multiple definitions, the term counter-revolution has been the subject of far less scholarly attention. As Charles T. stated more than half a century ago, there is no theory of counter-revolution as such, which remains true till today. Again, however, I have no time to deal with the question more thoroughly here, and therefore I will just say what I will understand as counter-revolution. Counter-revolution is fundamental domestic change in political institutions, leadership, and government activity and policies, accompanied by deep changes in the social structure and system of values, so the same, 
aiming to reverse previous revolutionary change and to overthrow the revolutionary ideology. Then, if a revolution is needed to have a counter-revolution, let us just briefly look on the case of Central Eastern European countries. Was there a revolution? To answer this question, we need to move back to 1917. The Bolshevik takeover of 1917 has a big literature. It is commonly agreed in political science that it was an effect of a revolution, one of two model revolutions in a history, along with the French Revolution. Since a thorough discussion of this scholarship is beyond the scope of the, uh, uh, of the paper, suffice it to say uh, that the events of, uh, from 1917 have all the attributes of a revolution. They were rapid and violent and uh, instigated a fundamental change in politics and society. Moreover, such actions were subordinated to a holistic ideology, which was communism. One of the main tenets of the communist ideology was the need to spread revolution across the world. The Bolsheviks expected a world revolution to occur soon after they gained power in 1917, as they considered themselves part of the international proletarian revolutionary movement. According to typology presented by Wojciech Roszkowski, the communist takeover in East Central Europe after 1939 followed three models. Incorporation, the export of revolution, and the local revolutions. The first pattern was carried out in the Baltic states, Eastern Polish and Czechoslovak territories, and Northeastern region of Romania. The second method was adopted in the case of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, and the third in Yugoslavia in, and Albania. It could, it could be argued that all three models meet the definition of revolution and should be treated as such. It could be also treated as a continuation of the revo communist revolution of 1917 through its transmission to further countries to some extent fulfilling the plan that did not succeed immediately after the Great October Revolution. All of these cases contain the requisite attributes of revolution discussed earlier. The communist parties in the Central Europe did not come to power by themselves, but rather through a revolution from above, orchestrated from abroad by the Red Army. However, while it must be stressed that this definition does not specify whether a revolution is limited to action taken by domestic forces or whether it can be used to describe changes brought in from the outside, it also does not limit it to actions taken from below. Hence, the communist takeover in the Central Europe is to be treated as a revolution, even if it was not instigated by internal forces, marking instead the continuation of a process begun earlier. What happened in 1989 then? All theoretical models attempting to describe the events on, uh, of uh, 1989 in Central Europe are between the notions of revolution and reform. Both of them exhibit inherent conceptual limitations, and they do not fully match what took place. These conceptual limitations are reflected in the vacillation of some academic adherents of the revolutionary interpretation of the fall of communism in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Dragos Petrescu stated that contrary to the great revolutions, the overthrow of the communist regimes were, were, uh, was not, not motivated by the utopian visions or class strug uh, struggle and, except in Romania, was not violent. It reveals how difficult it is to speak uh, of the events of 1989 as a revolution. There was neither a holistic idea or, uh, nor an ide ideology driving the rapid and fundamental changes to the political and social system nor there was mass-scale violence, with the exception of Romania. Two decisive elements of uh, the definition are missing. What is most important, however, is the absence of the element of ideology. As stated earlier, a revolution cannot exist without it. Let's uh, us now um, 
take a closer look to the, at the crucial question of ideology. Was there really no ideological dimension of the events of 1989? A review of the uh, movements that overthrew the communist regimes suggests that there was not. The, uh, the only con common denominator was the desire to live like those in the West. In its visible, uh, it is visible uh, in the creation of umbrella-type movements in uh, Central European countries. Popular movements uh, such as Solidarity in Poland and the Civic uh, Forum uh, and Public Against Violence in Czechoslovakia consisted of many different political groupings and after the collapse of communism uh, either ceased to exist like Civic Forum and Public Against Violence or lost significance. In Hungary the situation was to some extent different. There was no single political force uniting all of the major movements striving to overthrow communism. Although the strongest party, the Hungarian Democratic Forum, was a hegemon and is often, often perceived as a, such a mass umbrella organization. Uh, it was because the classical party system began to form in the last year of the regime. In Romania, a popular revolt has overthrown the ruling party and dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, while systemic political changes came much later. However, both in Romania and Bulgaria, the opposition also tried to unite by forming larger coalitions, the National Salvation Committee and the Union of Democratic Forces, respectively, with no common specific program, not to mention ideology. In the GDR, the collapse of communism occurred in the most symbolic way. Following the opening of the gates of uh, the Berlin Wall, people were allowed to pass the border between the East and the West, thus voting by their feet through their preference uh, for the Western way of life. The Westernization was quickly, quickly concluded with the incorporation of the GDR into the Federal Republic of Germany. This was noted also by Klaus Offe, uh, I quote, this upheaval of, uh, is a revolution without a historical model and a revolution without revolutionary theory. Instead of concepts, strategies, mediating bodies and normative principles, there are individuals and their discoveries of the moment with their deliberately opaque semantic contact, content. Among them are the catchwords Guasnost and Perestroika, and the metaphor of common European home, end of quotation. Uh, it appears that Offe describes the lack of holistic idea or ideology that accompanied events of 1989 in Central Europe. Moreover, he acknowledges uh, that all prior revolutions were driven at least in part by ide ideology again quotation, in all revol of revolutions in the last two centuries, some kind of answer to these questions had been available before the revolutionary actions were ta was taken, uh, though most of them proved wrong. On the other uh, side, those who maintain that the changes ushered uh, in by the events of 1989 were of an evolutionary nature, fail to account fully for the scope and the complexity of the change as well as its na na rapid uh, nature. They focus on the transition period instead, asserting that after a series of initial rapid changes, the ones that followed were slower and aimed at reforming the states of Central and Eastern Europe in an evolutionary way. Even if it's true, our assessment of the nature of the event of 19, events of 1989 cannot be limited to the period after uh, 1989. Such a narrowing uh, of the scope explains little, while so, uh, also distorting our understanding of a complex phenomenon. What's more, adherents of this explanation failed to fully grasp the meaning uh, and the consequences of overthrowing communist ideology. Uh, for these are obfuscated by the evolutionary or reformist approach to the autumn of nations 1989. Taking into consideration the fact 
that the communist ideology, which organized everyday life in communist countries until the fall of the system, a thorough analysis of the process of its collapse is essential, and not having devoted sufficient time and rigor to, its, to it constitutes a major limitation of those theories. The above uh, described limitations reveal the need for a theory that, that would be free of them. In my opinion, the term counter-revolution is more apt description because it explains the collapse of communism more precisely, capturing the uh, rapid, non-violent, and thoroughgoing nature of the change, while also accounting for the absence of the holistic ideology. On the contrary, its aim was to overcome a previously imposed ideology, which was brought with the revolution. The existence of mass umbrella type organizations even strengthens the argument. They not only lacked an ideology, but also had internally differing views when it came to policies to be adopted in the future. Ran Halevi's description of counter-revolution reflects this reality. Not everyone has the same, it's a quotation, not everyone has the same vision, even the same nostalgia of what has been destroyed, and they are less in agreement as to what ought to be restored. Another factor which speaks to the counter-revolutionary nature, nature of the autumn of nation, nations is the question of dictatorship. As Teda Scott, uh, Scott Spall has noted, social revolutions have led to the installation of authoritarian regimes. She concludes it, the overthrow of communist dictatorships in the name of national, economic, and political freedom inaugurated a new day in the annals of revolution in modern history. However, I would conclude the opposite. Rather, this point bolsters my argument that the events of 1989 were not a revolution, but rather the overthrow of dictatorship, uh, dictatorships imposed by the communist revolution. It means counter-revolution. The only remaining question is whether the counter-revolutionary events of 1989 were an attempt to undo a revolution. On the one hand, the aim was to abandon communist ideology. It means the ideology enforced by the revolution of 1917 exported to the Central and Eastern Europe in 1940s. On the other hand, the events of 1989 did not lead to a return to the pre-war constitutions, parties, and social systems. In this context, it is legitimate to ask whether the events of 1989 re reversed the revolutions to the extent that they constituted a counter-revolution. It was the Maitre who stated that the French Revolution, uh, after the French Revolution, that, quotation, a huge revolution leaves always something after her, end of quotation and affects also its opponents, which makes it impossible to reverse completely. Fred Halliday has put it more forcefully, quotation, counter-revolution cannot turn the clock back. It cannot restore in full measure that we, uh, which was there before. The passage of time, the very impact of revolution, prevents replication. Just as revolution claims to reject the past, but cannot entirely do so, so counter-revolution cannot realize its claim to restore that which was overthrown, end of quotation. All the more so when a revolution shapes a country's public sphere for decades, 40, 45 years in the case of Central and Eastern Europe, and over 70 years in that of the Soviet Union. After such a long period, it is absolutely impossible to return to the conditions that were in force before the revolution. Indeed, Adherents of overthrowing communism did not try or even think of attempting to simply return to pre-war political and social system. Rather, they set their sights on Europe, which meant for them the West. However, there were some attempts to pre uh, present the changes of 1989 as marking a return to the pre-revolutionary pre system. 
They were mostly symbolic and included the return to the pre-communist name of the, Pol for example, in the Polish state from People's Republic of Poland to Republic of Poland Rzeczpospolita Polska and the removal of communist symbols from national flags. Such attempts were also present in politics as some pre-revolutionary parties were reinstated. Also some attempts of restitutions of property and return to pre-revolutionary structure of ownership can be found in the analyzed countries. These examples attest to the need to stress at least symbolically a return to pre-revolutionary times. However, if as stated above, a simple return to pre-revolutionary times is not possible, one has to think about a time lag between pre-revolutionary times and the, move, and the moment of alleged counter-revolution. It means that broadly understood system that existed before the revolution could have developed or evolved outside the territory under re revolutionary rule. And this is exactly what happened in Central and Eastern Europe and in the West. As before the revolution, the systems in the region were at basic level similar to those in the West. After World War II, the communist revolution was introduced in Central and Eastern Europe, while the West developed into democratic system. And yet, after it overthrew the communist uh, regimes in 1989, Central and Eastern Europe declared its desire to join the West and to be slim, similar once more to return to a normal pre-revolutionary path of development. Insofar as it uh, marked a return to a pre-revolutionary path of development, the counter-revolution undid the communist revolution. In this light, the events of 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe contained the elements of a counter-revolution. The changes were fundamental, both political, social, and economic, and aimed at reversing previous revolutionary changes and overthrowing a revolutionary ideology. This makes them a counter-revolution. What is also worth noting, it was the most complex counter-revolution in a history, as it was successful and reversed revolution that was in power for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, the last speaker, the last uh, panelist uh, in this panel will be uh, Martin Stefek, who works uh, at the Institute of uh, Political Science of uh, Charles University. His research and writing center on comparative political science and Czech contemporary history. He is the author of two monographs in Czech, uh, one about uh, mutual relations of the Czechoslovak and East German communists uh, in the second half of the 1980s, and the other one about the nomenclature in uh, Czechoslovakia in the time of the Prague Spring and the beginning of uh, normalization. And the title of his today's presentation is The Collapse of Communism, the Last Hooray of Totalitarianism, <coughs> sorry, totalitarianism Theory? Question mark. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here today, and I thank organizers for inviting me today. Uh, we are discussing in our panel uh, international context of uh, 1989, uh, new methods, new findings. Uh, the subtitle of my paper presentation is uh, The Last Hurrah of Totalitarian Theory. So I will focus more on intellectual uh, history and intellectual context, international context of uh, 1989, uh, because I believe that it's a part of story. Uh, I must take clear, clearly that my perspective could be biased uh, by my disciplinar disciplinary perspective, since my main discipline is comparative politics. Many people uh, contended that Czech academia uh, has undergone discussions about applicability, usefulness, use and misuses of uh, the totalitarian theory. 
In the past, I heard uh, opinions according to which uh, we have solved all issues concerning uh, this uh, theory, and many people say that uh, this debate or this, this debate uh, kept us in a, a futile uh, discussions. Um, not at all. I really do believe that uh, every generation of scholars uh, should discuss methodology uh, uh, once again, once again. Of course, some interesting books uh, and articles uh, have been published, some conferences uh, took place, but I believe that the issue has no definitive solution uh, since there are still either opponents and or uh, proponents of the theory, whatever it means actually. Regarding this theory, or I should rather say theorist, because we should say in plural, many scholars in the West, historians, political scientists, sociologists are indifferent uh, today. Many of them say that the theory is a mere historical artifact and, uh, you know, I agree with this stance actually. In the field of empirical political science, the concept disappeared. Today's typologies do not involve word totalitarianism at all. Look at books and articles of authors like Barbara Geddes, Axel Thiero, uh, Jan Hadenius, Michal Svolík, Jennifer Gandhi, or Mike Alvarez to, uh, to remind the most influencing scholars. Naturally, today for them this concept is useless since any theory of totalitarianism did not provide analytic tools for quantification or for studying causal relations. So there arises a crucial question. Can we be indifferent considering huge impact the theory had on political thought in the 20th century? Needless to say that the concept relates not only to some very banal and very often mutually conflicting definitions from the mid 20th century, but also, and I believe it is crucial for our today's debate, that the concept of totalitarianism or concepts of totalitarianisms relates implicitly or explicitly to some fundamental post-war system of thoughts, epistemologies, theoretical systems. For many distinguished scholars, totalitarianism was kind of horizon for their work. For instance, for Popper's theory of science, for Hannah Arendt's theory of action, for Isaiah Berlin, uh, the concept of freedom to remind some of them. Therefore, in my opinion, both proponents and opponents should not avoid facing uh, this famous tradition. Accepting or refusing of the theory must be preceded by reconciliation. It is clear that the aim of my presentation is not to answer the question of what type of regime collapsed uh, in 1989, uh, whether totalitarian, authoritarian, or other. Rather, I'd like to shed a light on so far omitted topic of comebacks of the theory. And I'm arguing today that 1989 was paradoxically the last chance for, for the concept or for the concepts. Naturally, we have no time to summarize uh, life and times of the theory. 
I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the history of the word and history of the concept, but there is one thing we should not omit. It is connection of the theory with the unique socio-economic contexts of the Cold War in post-war America. Discussing the heyday of totalitarian theory, one should not uh, disregard close ties uh, between governments and so-called Sovietology after the Second World War, the anti-intellectual uh, climate in the era of McCarthyism in the 1950s, the influence of army and intelligence on academia or surveillance of scholars in the mid uh, 20th century. But when these conditions dramatically changed, the totalitarian model faded away. Dominance of totalitarian model ceased to exist over the course of 1960s it is historical fact uh, well documented in literature and I think it is not controversial statement anyway. For social uh, scientists in 1960s, there were good reasons, mainly methodological and epistemological reasons for abandoning uh, the theory. Talking about Anglo-American mainstream, scholars, engaged in behavioral methodologies of this period did not need concepts based on impression, fear, intuition, or mystic. When George Kennan tried to define totalitarianism in 1953, he stated in its quotation, the purest expression of the phenomenon seems to me to have been rendered not in its physical reality, but in its power as a dream, as a nightmare. That is to say, many theorists were helpless. Therefore, they relied on expressions like Kafkaesque nightmare. Now it is clear, maybe, why scientific community considered the concept as useless. Of course, on the field of political philosophy or political theory, uh, the situation could be slightly different. Still, it is doubtful whether there is difference between theory of totalitarianism, whatever it means, and essayistic approach. So uh, the theory faded away, but did not disappear uh, completely. From 1960s on, there were numerous efforts in different contexts to revive it. And was, what was the reason for reviving it? That is to say, a totalitarian model was never limited to academic sphere. On the contrary theorists who very often had nothing to do with politics were not able to liberate the model from its original sin. It is from uh, its connection with politics. Taking into consideration this fact, we understand better the superior position of the concept after the Second World War. Totalitarianism came to the fore once again in the 1970s and 1980s, together with so-called neoliberal turn. As I shall demonstrate, uh, it has similar foundations as classic approaches after the Second World War, despite the fact that con content of the concept was slightly different from post-war classics some political backing or support helped with the resuscitation of the totalitarian model. That is to say, intellectual gurus of uh, neoliberals like Friedrich August von Hayek 
or Milton Friedman had represented a minor school of thought after the Second World War. Particularly, Hayek's uh, famous book, Road to Freedom, oh, sorry, Road to Serfdom, published in 1944, sunk into oblivion immediately after the war. It had very limited impact, both among academicians and politicians. When they came to the fore again in 1970s, they had both project for transformation of economic systems, but also expression of its opposite or deplorable contradiction, I would say. For instance, Friedman came up with the idea according which there are only two conflicting modes of economic, economic uh, coordination. The market on the one hand and totalitarian mode of uh, coordination on the other hand. Let's remind Hayek's stance from the road to serfdom. He stated that the danger of totalitarianism is raised by the policy of economic planning. Economic view of the phenomenon could appeal in this period since political post-war classics faded away. So Hayek's concept of totalitarianism uh, has different content, but I would say similar effects. First and foremost, it brings black and white contradictionary scheme typical for post-war older concepts. While for Karl Friedrich, the opposite of totalitarianism was constitutional democracy. For Isaiah Berlin, pluralism. For Hannah Arendt, politics. Friedrich Hayek constitutes another dichotomy. Now I'm quoting from his book, The Constitution of Liberty. The difference between the two ideals stands out most clearly if we name their opposites. For democracy, it is authoritarian government. For liberalism, it is totalitarianism. Neither of the two systems necessarily excludes the opposite of the other. A democracy may well wield totalitarian powers, and it is conceivable that an authoritarian government may act on liberal principles. Later, after the Pinochet coup in Chile in 1973, uh, Friedrich Hayek said that authoritarian regimes can protect freedom better than democracies. And this dichotomy is crucial for understanding of the last revival of totalitarian theory. It was basically used by Jane Kirkpatrick in her 1979 famous article called Dictatorships and Double Standards. Certainly, it was critic of Carter's inaction after the revolution in Iran and Nicaragua. Yet, the double standard was expressed by depiction of two types of non-democracies. Allegedly, unreformable totalitarianism on the one hand and allegedly reformable authoritarianism on the other hand. This is to say Kirkpatrick's expertise had considerable influence on President Reagan during the 1980s. Later, Professor Archie Brown prophetically warned it was in 1980. He said that, that if you were to identify all communist systems as totalitarian and to say that totalitarian states 
could not be radically altered from within, then at least one of those propositions had to be wrong. Not Kirkpatrick, but Archie Brown, one of few Western scholars who publicly thematized Soviet reform before it, before it happened, was right. Few years after Kirkpatrick's prediction, the reform from within started in the USSR. Just as a matter of interest, what was the story of Kirkpatrick theory after the fall of communism? Uh, it's very interesting. In 1989, she published an article. It was November 1989, uh, where she asserted that uh, the former communist states in Eastern Europe could resemble the logic of Pinochet authoritarian states. So uh, I would say uh, her belief in her own model was very strong. But after the fall of communism, proponents of totalitarian theory lost the only existing or main empirical example of totalitarian system. Some of them, referring to post-war classical writers, probably forgot that Hannah Arendt, as early as 1958, stated clearly that the USSR was, I'm quoting, very keen to abandon some of the methods we are come to identify with totalitarian rule. Some of them forgot that Karl Friedrich, another classical author, diluted the power of his own concept, pondering about totalitarian tendencies in France and the United States. So, in fact, he stretched the concept considerably. As I have said, the concept does not exist anymore in the field of empirical social sciences. It faded away several times in the field of historiography and area studies. Of course, there are famous authors insisting on the usefulness of the theory. Yet, after 1989, totalitarian theories got a chance in Central East Europe. After 1989, it became, with a delay, a general framework for study. This was kind of last, but probably not very last, major revival of the tradition which is not taken from granted today in the West. Leaving aside some intuitive application of the word, there is one reason for this last revival. The story of post-war tradition, the rise and fall of the theory, mirrors all crucial paradigmatic disputes in the field of social and human sciences. Czechoslovak Academia did not participate in the discussions, unfortunately, before 1989 with the short interlude uh, in the second half of 1960s. So to conclude, last hurrah of the totalitarian theory after 1989 is integral part of our contemporary intellectual history. It could signify peculiarity of post-communist academia. Therefore, in my opinion, it's worth discussing. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. So thank you for the last presentation. And now we have about 25 minutes for a discussion. Uh, I already see a few arms up. So uh, you may ask your questions either in, in English or in Czech, because our panelists have headsets, I hope. <laughs> so uh, there was a lady in the back uh, first. 
not exactly a lady. Michal Kopecik. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this panel. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. I would have a uh, first uh, question or comment, I'm not sure, to uh, Lubica. I really liked uh, your uh, paper and, and it brought a really very different perspective what, from what, what we are usually discussing here in, in, in this country. Uh, nationalism and human rights, and especially this question, uh, where was the Serbian Havel? Uh, I, I, mean, I like it, uh, it's, it's though at the same time very much personalized, and I think that Nick Miller also knew that it is uh, like personalization of a broader topic. And the topic, of course, is um, how come that the opposition in these countries, in Yugoslavia and here, developed differently, and how come that this opposition here could have sort of balanced the nationalism and the revived national identities with human rights agenda uh, interpreted more and more in liberal, uh, in liberal key, right? Because this, this is not that there was no nationalism here, obviously, especially the Hungarian case with oh, so many minorities outside. I mean, you know, the national question was a huge question, but some, somehow uh, they managed. And I would propose two uh, explanations. One is, of course, configuration. You have you know, if you compare Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, the configuration of the clashing nationalisms is very, very different. You have only two here, you have not so much intertwining, so you can have a velvet divorce in 1992-3. You cannot achieve it at all in Yugoslavia. But the other thing, indeed, is the opposition. I mean, the, the way how the alternative elite is being uh, formed. And, and for me, this is really a, a huge uh, question for intellectual and cultural uh, history, because here, in East Central Europe, the opposition really develops, as we know, after 68, from this post-Marxist or still Marxist opposition. And it takes a long time. In Poland, it's already in 68, in a way. In Hungary, it takes the whole 1970s. You know, most of the oppositionists are Marxist at that point, And they are uh, sort of separating them from Marxism. And I think that Janusz Kisz <coughs> is, the best, is the best example of this consequent thinker who turns from Marxist critique to human rights and who pick up then the liberal key. In Yugoslavia, you have the strongest oppositional group, Praxis, who are still proceeding with a Marxist interpretation of human rights. And they turn in the 1980s not to individual human rights agenda, but actually to nationalism. And this is really a fascinating thing. And I mean, like, I, if, if you can elaborate on it. And from that, I come to question uh, to David. So David, you portrayed somewhat the human rights agenda as a really uh, part of liberal package. But at the same time, I still feel that we have to sort of like more historicize the human rights debate because up until 1970s and to some extent 1980s, the socialist interpretation was still very influential. It was influential in the official, by the official communist regimes. You know, they were really, they were institutes of human rights. They were like a huge production of human rights uh, interpreted not in liberal, but in collectivist and socialist key. And this was interpretation that was also very influential in the third world. Uh, so in a way, uh, uh, and it was actually a fascinating thing, is that it was influential also within the dissident movements. There are so many people the, in Czechoslovakia, Jiri Hayek, right, Mlinaš, like those coming from the 68 uh, position, they would still, you know, they, they, they would go into the, for this kind of proto-liberal interpretation. Yes, individual human rights are important, but collective human rights are as much important, and social economic rights are very, very important. So my question for you is, when does this, and I think that Samuel Moyna has also something of it, like, when does this liberal interpretation of human rights really prevail? Is it Helsinki? Is it post-Helsinki? Or is it only 1989 when it comes to the fore? Thank you. thought we'll collect some. Thank you very much. I mean, there, were, there are so many points here and questions. I'm afraid I can't answer everything, but I can try to reflect on some of the points uh, you raised. Uh, well, you're absolutely right that Praxis, uh, ironically, many members, especially some of the Serbian members of Praxis, turned into nationalists and ardent nationalists as well. So uh, I think because the Marxist understandings embedded in the Yugoslav constitution and, as I said, the withering away of the state, self-determination. So some of this legalistic language which was incorporated into the kind of the Yugoslav notion of socialism was very much intertwined with... It was an ethno-territorial federation, right, Yugoslavia. So the ethnic and the Marxist, you know, was very much intertwined. And I think this gave some of these people from Praxis also a very easy venue 
you know, out of a very ideological uh, paradigm into a kind of uh, Serbian uh, nationalism. But I think the main difference with the, uh, with the uh, Eastern European opposition was that, uh, as I said, a lot of these people uh, basically saw the nation as the primary you know, goal of this transformation after 89 rather than individual human rights. So I wrote my PhD on this youth kind of movement in the 1980s and it was basically the younger generation that embraced this proto-liberalism, the language of civil rights, especially the Slovenian youth movements, as you might know, uh, a lot of them also in Macedonia, in Bosnia. So it was a younger generation which uh, also espoused the language of human rights and actually 1989 in Paris there was a big festival celebrating the anniversary of the French Revolution and a lot of these youngsters, it was a European event, participated there and they came back to Yugoslavia with this language yeah, of civil rights, uh, etc. Ironically, the older generation, the generation of Milosevic, Tujman, you know, uh, they were the ones who had uh, an experience also of the Second World War uh, and of the early post-war period, who uh, basically, uh, you know, they didn't have this distance from the ethnic conflict in the Second World War, from the civil war in the Second World War, that uh, basically uh, turned from communists into nationalists. Uh, so I think there is a very powerful generational story to be told uh, there as well. Uh, uh, but about your question, when uh, kind of the liberal conceptions of human rights uh, come into play. I, I think in the Yugoslav case, I say, uh, as I said, there is a generational divide. And the Helsinki committees, which were very much powerful, and there was a, uh, a movement, it was a, the only pan-Yugoslav movement actually I've written about, the United Yugoslav Democratic Alternative, it was called, UIDI, which united this uh, uh, basically intellectuals, some of them were 68ers, many were critiques of the regime, some who were also dis dissidents in the Yugoslav sense, you know, uh, basically not in prison, but they were fired and put into these institutes. But a lot of this liberal opposition in Yugoslavia was pan-Yugoslav, uh, and uh, I, but again, it was a very clear divide between the uh, bureaucratic communist, you know, elite uh, at the republic level uh, and the one which was uh, more circulating at federal level and kind of in these intellectual circles. So ironically, at yeah, the federal level was much more liberal and progressive at the end of the 80s than the republican communists in that sense. So I hope that answers some of your questions. Yes. If I could just address this question of human rights. I'm not an expert on, on human rights, so, but, but uh, it's a lively, very lively field and, and, and you raise a really important question. Yes, of course, I should have been distinguished between in, individual and collective rights, human rights, and as you said, absolutely, there is a conflict over what human rights mean and, and people are working on that as well. But I suppose that a lot of the recent uh, debate and literature, sort of people like Sam Moyne, people like... Um, um, uh, Hoffman and others have been very much trying to look at, think about and debate this, when this emerged and what it was about. And I think that's also, you know, we need to do this in a whole lot of fields, I think, particularly gender, women's rights, gender rights, these sorts of things. Now, I think there's a debate and a distant difference between people over that is my understanding, and perhaps Lubitsa knows more than I, I'm sure, working on human rights more than, that is more than I do, but my understanding is that whereas you know, some people like Sam Moyne would be emphasizing the 70s and he would particularly be emphasizing the attempt to attack sort of uh, the sort of third worldist um, new international economic order type of views of human rights as being collective and, and imp help, uh, you know, in, in implemented by nation states. He, he sees it as partly a backlash against that type of politics. And over a whole range of intellectual fields, for, for instance, development policy, Amartya Sen's view of development policy, notion of basic human cap capabilities, you know, all of these things are connected with a general movement, I think, a, anti, a non-Marxist, anti-Marxist movement, in the case of Ant, uh, Amartya Sen as well, um, against the notion of collective rights. Um, I think others, though, would emphasize more as, Hoff, you know, like Hoffman, would emphasize the 90s more, and, and particularly this, uh, as he says, the post-Yugoslav 
conflict and the de debate about what to do about human rights infringements in the 90s. I think also we see that with, with things like gender, women's rights, gender rights, that there is this much more individual, you know, when, when the UN becomes interested in sort of doing these grand human rights projects in the 1990s involving development, women's rights, human rights, um, uh, you know, sexuality rights, those sorts of things. Then, of course, it's a different environment. They, they, and, and there, often that is then connected with this very liberal individualist notion, um, not anti-collectivist anti notion. So I'm no expert. I, I mean, absolutely, I think this needs to be written. It's, a, it's an important subject. I, s <clears throat> I saw two more hands raised there. Uh, James Mark in the back, or, oh, okay, so go ahead, please. My question is very quick, it's for Dr. Stefek. Um, if I understood correctly, you said that uh, the notion of totalitarianism revived in Central Europe after 1989, um, but already in the late 80s, Adam Miknik and even Václav Havel were using the term and in the case of Havel, it's particularly curious because earlier in The Power of the Powerless, he had spoken of post-totalitarianism. Can you explain this? Well, thank you very much. You know, uh, yeah, I simplified that. Uh, uh, Václav Havel not only was talking about post-totalitarianism, but uh, I remember his, uh, his text uh, written in 1988 uh, when uh, he stated clearly that uh, Czechoslovakia in 1980s is totalitarian state. But, you know, uh, my aim of, of the presentation was to explain or, yeah, to explain uh, how and why uh, this model uh, became predominant in Czech or Central European academia uh, uh, after the revolution. Uh, of course, uh, when we remember writings of Zdeněk Mlinář uh, from exile, uh, he's very similar, you know. So, um, I would say a totalitarian model uh, utilized many people in different times, and of course, um, Václav Havel or people in exile uh, were a very important source for Czechoslovak academia after the revolution. Uh, but my aim was slightly, slightly different. But uh, you're right, and you know I, I must compliment one, one, one thing. Uh, even people in Western academia who who publish texts about uh, totalitarianism model concept or the phenomenon uh, very often quoted uh, Václav Havel and Central European Central European dissidents. So of course it was a very important source of information. Yeah, thank you for, for this complimentation. So now, James Mark. Uh, thank you for these papers. I have two questions. One is, I think, developing from what Lubitsa and David said about pushing this question of self-determination. Um, and when Lubitzer and I were writing this book um, on 1989, we were very struck by the fact that nobody really tries to put 89 in the global history of self-determination in the 20th century. It remains a story very much part of a broader narrative, but it's told on its own. So partly we were thinking of why that is, and partly I think it's because of the reception of post-colonialism here, which has been mainly, I think, on the right, and has been mainly about telling stories of victimized nations and occupation and actually has much less interest in thinking about the relationship of the region to this broader 20th century phenomenon. Um, it also, I think, comes out of the sort of late socialist dissident movements, which I think expunged socialist internationalism or any kind of internationalism from their agendas when they started thinking about self-determination as national struggles or at best regional struggles, which wasn't true in the 1960s if you look at the work of people who had become known as dissidents later on. Um, but it gets us to think about whether there are connections. I, and just to mention one that might be interesting in sparking other thoughts, um, the work of Stephen Jensen, The Making of International Human Rights, in which he argues that, in fact, communist states themselves were very active in the 1960s in promoting notions of collective self-determination at the UN. 
He argues this gets retooled in the Helsinki Accords in the 1970s. Um, and actually very similar people are involved in these things. And this actually sparks off obviously movements for self-determination, both in terms of communist states claiming their own uh, right to claim their right to defend national, uh, national sovereignty, but also um, amongst dissident groups as well. So there are kind of connections between different movements in different parts of the world. Um, my second question, which is mainly for Martin, which is just pushing you a bit more on the connections between neoliberalism and totalitarianism. Because I think a lot of um, people are starting to argue, so in the 70s and 80s, these are two quite similar ideological forms which focus on um, giving agency to the individual, seeing rights as something individualized, whether it's political or economic rights. Um, and that actually totalitarian ways of thinking about past communist systems are very useful for neoliberals in the post-socialist um, period too. And that it may be not be surprising now, say in the last five years, that as people are criticizing transitions, um, they are um, looking to new forms of remembering dictatorship and getting justice for dictatorship, which aren't based on these individualistic conceptions, but rather on kind of collective claims for rights, which weren't um, worked through actually in transitions. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm grateful, yeah, James, that you mentioned, because the chapter really ex is much broader than what I presented here. Uh, so we also explored the links of uh, anti-imperial self-determination, as James said, in the 1960s, and how this informed both the language and activism of a lot of yeah, dissident movements in Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, there is a longer term history to be told, absolutely. And uh, we found also uh, that the two covenants on cultural and economic, oh, well, sorry, on uh, social and cultural rights, the two UN covenants and the other one on civil and political rights in the 1960s, so around 1968, basically also informed uh, uh, and mobilized this language of uh, the right to self-determination because this was the first time, apart from the UN Charter, that major international covenants basically uh, embedded the right to self-determination. Perhaps I could uh, just, yes, sort of follow on from that. And firstly, I should apologize for not mentioning Lubitz's contribution to this volume. And, it's, and I hadn't managed to, and actually not incorporating her important chapter, which I hadn't had a chance to read because the book just arrived before, before I came here. So, um, I mean, I think this, this issue about self-determination and the role of 1989 in, in that is, is one that I will have to think about and how to incorporate that into one's conceptualization of 1989. And it's an important addition because, of course, the way it's often been tended to, uh, you know, we, we, we've often tended to conceptualize it is as a sort of, oh, it's Huntington versus Fukuyama. You know, it's, uh, you know, Fukuyama had this sort of pro-1980 view. Huntington was saying 1989 was, actually, um, you know, actually was a sort of well, not very important and there are all these ethnic, um, you know, deep-rooted ancient ethnic hatreds that were just being unfrozen. Now, I, you know, so, so I think we probably do need to incorporate um, this into one's global conceptual, conceptualization of a global 89 and clearly this paper and the, and the chapter clearly are doing that and I must rush and read it when I've, when I'm, um, when I, when I've finished this. But I, th I think one, one perhaps way of thinking about it might be to, um, you know, think of it perhaps as, you know, again, it, it sounds as if we've got to think about, the, you know, the issue of 1989 itself and then dis distant, uh, separated it from, you know, uh, the effects of 1989 and struggles over how to deal with the aftermath of 1989 and, and which powerful groups are able to do that or who isn't able to do that. And clearly neoliberals are able to do it in some places. Other nationalist ethnic groups are able to do it in other regions. So that may be one way of doing that. But I think it's, it's clearly an important uh, um, thing to, you know, aspect of the, the, which hasn't really been thought about uh, clearly before this book. Um, and then more broadly, yes, I mean, absolutely on the human rights um, issue and on the communist role in promoting global rights of a certain type. And I think another aspect of this historiography that really hasn't been, is being brought out now only is, is, is in the global history literature is the role of communist uh, regimes and, and their, their conception of gender, of women's rights, 
and, ge and gender politics. And I think that is something which uh, probably has been rather neglected in the last 20 years and now is emerging as a powerful role, has a, having a powerful role again in the global south and in, in the promotion of a sort of state, uh, state feminism, if you like, in the global south. Um, so, yeah, great, um, re really important point. Oh, yeah, to answer... Uh, uh, James remarked a very important point. Uh, what I wanted to say in my presentation was primarily that uh, most influencing uh, models of totalitarianism uh, were uh, part of wider theoretical systems. For instance, it is very difficult to understand Hannah Arendt's uh, concept of totalitarianism without the knowledge of her uh, theory of uh, action it is very difficult to understand the heyday of totalitarian theory without the knowledge of, uh, of socio-economic and political context of the Cold War. Uh, as for, as for uh, the uh, connection of totalitarian model and neoliberalism, uh, I would complement, or pro I, I hope I'm answering your question. Very important is to understand uh, Friedrich Hayek's concept of individual freedom, which is closely connected with his criticism of, of application of exact, exact sciences uh, to study of uh, society, his criticism of scientism. So uh, I'm considering the connection of neoliberalism and totalitarianism as this type of philosophical reasoning. So that's my answer. Thank you. Another question, Dr. Voracek. Uh, thank you very much. You know, uh, my point is, it is very interesting to speak about the story of totalitarianism now, today. But I would like to support uh, the, another discussion, because when speaking about the transition of the, the revolutions in, in the end of 1989, the collapse of communism, we should speak about more about the different uh, transitions to democracy. There is a huge literature about it, but when you are already speaking about this story of totalism, it's last hurrah. Fine, okay, I agree. Uh, but I would like add something. Perhaps you should tell me about it or us. Because uh, this theory of totalitarianism, perhaps it was it's her last hurrah. But the more important is this theory of totalitarianism, better to say it's simplificated uh, optic, was very, very, was very efficiently used to the black and white interpretation of what was uh, coming in the end of 1980s, 1989 and 1990. Uh, <clears throat> because it was very popular in these days in the Central Europe, as well in Czechoslovakia, okay, there's a development, uh, this uh, dictatorship and totalitarianism, and with very simplificated uh, words to very short describe what happened in Czechoslovakia in the in these 40 years of uh, of uh, ruling of communism. Today is, of course, we are and uh, we have more experience. And we should uh, to evaluate, uh, and we shouldn't forget that this theory, it was very, one, one, once called as a doctrine of anti-communism, from the point of view of the uh, Soviet of the Eastern. Second, the, the very um, <clears throat> good build-up uh, theory of uh, the development of the closed societies. And, but we shouldn't uh, to, 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 uh, to forget uh, its role, what role it played, especially not from the point of the scientists, but of the politicians and uh, journalists in the years 1989-1991 and later. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I would say that uh, you, you are talking, talking about the transitions. Uh, as, as, oh yeah. Uh, as for the Western perspectives, uh, I should mention the fact that uh, the discipline of transitology, uh, which emerged at the turn of 80s and 90s, uh, 
uh, did not use uh, the word totalitarianism and it was clearly separated from uh, the logic of old models of totalitarianism. What are you talking about was typical for Czechoslovak or Central European academia uh, after, after the fall of communism. Therefore, I was talking about the last hurrah because uh, the kind of simplifications you are talking about were not typical for transit transitologists uh, of the Western academia. It was typical for our academia or for 20 years after the Velvet Revolution. Of course, uh, times changing uh, past 10 years, I would say. So, yeah, I hope I answered uh, your question. I would, I would clearly separate uh, the Western perspective and our, therefore I'm talking about last hurrah, right? Okay, any further questions? Well, Pavel Ukielski hasn't got a question, so I may have one. Uh, would you say that uh, according to the political science theory, as you explained it, um, the attempts to reform or flatly overthrow the communist regimes throughout their existence, such as the one in Hungary in 1956, were also counter-revolutions? So generally speaking, that the communist terminology was more or less correct. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, because uh, it's uh, also interesting and uh, in some, uh, to some point in my scope of interest. I would say that it depends. Some of them, well, the crucial is the aim. Whether they aim to overthrow the imposed ideology, and in this sense, Hungarian 1956 was more counter-revolution than, for example, Prague Spring. Because Prague Spring was more to reform the system, not overthrowing the ideology. In, the, in Hungary in 1956, especially in the second phase of the uprising, it was to overthrow the imposed uh, uh, ideology, uh, to overthrow the communism, uh, at least to some extent. So each case should be analyzed in a different way. The most complicated case would be with solidarity movement in Poland, uh, which was uh, very often it is uh, called self-limiting uh, revolution. So in my, in my understanding, it would be self-limiting counter-revolution. Uh, so each case should be, uh, should be treated separately, but I would say that some of them were at least attempts to do a kind of counter-revolution. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, our time is now up for this panel, so I will uh, very much thank to all the uh, panelists for their perfect presentations, and uh, which provoked, I think, a very interesting discussion. Uh, and we now have almost half an hour for a coffee break. Um, půl hodiny přestávka na kávu. Tak.